Hi, my name is Paul Ambroso. I am a junior malware analyst with Kaspersky Lab. So in the early part of 2014, I noticed an interesting trend with malware. It began to attack popular, always-on gaming social networks, the most popular of which being Steam. So I decided to investigate this trend. So what is Steam? And why is it not auto-advancing? Did you click? Needs to auto advance. Go. So what is Steam? Steam is an always on gaming platform owned by Valve. In this social network, you can buy AAA games that are frequently on sale, set up games with friends, post reviews, and recommend games to your friends. This slide shows some games created and released by Valve on their Steam platform. So although the number of games released by Valve is small, it boasts a large co collection of over 3,000 games from third-party publishers. And it's not auto-advancing again. There we go. Can I, get a, can I just get a clicker? No. No way. <laughs> go, go, go. <laughs> All right. Some of the more popular third-party titles include Football Manager 2015, Sid Meier's Civ 5, Skyrim, and Borderlands. This platform has a very large reach. Auto advance. <laughs> Thank you. This platform has a very large reach. The numbers you see here are just for the USA, but Steam boasts 75 million users worldwide. It's popular in North America, Russia, Europe, and Australia. This program is also localized entirely by volunteers into about 30 other languages. Defense of the Ancients 2, also called Dota 2, Steam's largest game, uses a free-to-play model. Gamers can play for free, but they can buy small trinkets in the game for cosmetic differences. These items can be traded in the Steam marketplace, as shown here. Gamers are trading these items 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Many of these items are worth a lot of money, even though the end result is purely cosmetic. Some items fetch hundreds of dollars, Others fetch thousands of, do of dollars, depending on their rarity. The most egregious, though, is an egg that's sold in Defense of the Ancients for $38,000. With virtual items that are worth a lot of money, and with most gamers being connected to the social network all the time, this leaves them particularly susceptible to attacks. Here you can see some statistics on just how many detections our product has thrown over the past year that we've been following Steam-related malware. So what hackers wanted was the ability to get into a Steam user's account and trade all items to the attacker. Then they resell the stolen items in the Steam marketplace. Then they can buy coupons for gifting games from the Steam store. Here you can see one such example on a gaming hack form. So how are they infecting user accounts? It started with a simple attack to get at these items. Steam initially encrypts your password when it's stored on your hard drive. However, the password is trivial to break. All a hacker needs to do is call the decrypt data for this machine function in steam2.dll, and it will decrypt it for you. Valve responded to these attacks with a security measure called SteamGuard. SteamGuard requires that a user authenticate each computer uh, using email verification. This was successful for a time, However, there was a fatal flaw with this approach. To prevent the user from having to re-authenticate their computer every time they want to log into Steam, Steam creates a file called SSFN, which states which accounts have already been authenticated on that computer. You can see it at the bottom of the slide here. If a hacker obtains this file and your login details, they can log into Steam as you, bypass Steam Guard, and steal all of your items. Here's an example of an SSFN phishing campaign. Hackers would create accounts to spam these websites on Steam, and users would go onto them thinking that there was a problem with their account. They would log in and download a file called steamguard.exe. When executed, this uploads your SSFN to the attacker. The hackers ran into a problem, though. The hacks were too time consuming. Hackers would have to log into each account and trade away all of the items. They soon found a way to automate this. They opened up the Steam web helper process, fetched your session ID, 
and then used your session ID to automatically force trade all of your items to the attacker. Finally, hackers found that spamming accounts were getting banned too quickly, and they didn't want to keep creating accounts over and over again. The latest versions of the Steam malware will automatically begin spamming your friends the web link to download the malware, as seen here. The malware is now a worm. We've been trying to get into contact with Valve for attack prevention. These attacks would be simple to prevent just by some additional security measures. We're communicating with them about these exploits in the hope that we can protect all 75 million of their users. But for now, these exploits have not been fixed. So, as you can see, these hacks have been growing in strength over the past year. Every single iteration of this malware has increased automation and ease of use for the attackers. What might be next? If someone has access to your account, then they might be able to make in-game purchases for you. It's tough to say what these hackers might dream up next, but all we can do is fix these hacks for now. The entirety of these Steam hacks rely on being able to open process on steamwebhelper.exe. If, an, if a user is not allowed to open this process, hackers cannot steal your items or spam your friends. However, there is another front for these malware attacks, and that is with Steam Guard. Other always-on gaming platforms are very successful in providing user security. Battle.net, created by Blizzard Entertainment, uses two-factor authentication using an app on your phone. A key provided by your app matches a key generated by the server, which authenticates you into the system. As a result, not a single account that has signed up for this service with Battle.net has ever been hacked. Preventing these attacks for the user requires only a little bit of common sense. First of all, no one is trying to send you a random funny picture. And also, never put your login credentials into anything other than the official Steam app or website. And also, item duplication hacks do not exist. Be wary of someone that randomly adds you as a friend on Steam. Any questions? Fantastic, thank you very, very much. It was really <laughs> nice Pecha Kucho style presentation, thank you. Any questions? We, we, as it is Pecha Kucho, we have time for questions. No? Hit me. So Steam is developing a new gaming platform. Can you speak up? I can't hear you. So Steam is developing a new gaming platform. Will this extend to that as well? Steam is developing what? A new gaming platform. The gaming platform. Right. Steam Machine. A new game. Oh, um, you mean for their um, um, SteamOS? Right. Um, SteamOS, um, I'm not too sure about that because that's going to be running on Linux, which is an entirely different operating system. So whether um, a user will be able to, um, to open process on something would depend on the, the Linux kernel, like what sort of uh, user privileges. Um, the user might have, so it, it really doesn't translate well from going from Windows into a Linux operating system. Uh, actually, in order to steal users' uh, all information, it's uh, the platform on web. It doesn't matter, is it like on Windows on Linux? So hackers can steal all information and like sell those, those items. But in order to run some malware, Steam didn't, didn't, didn't release uh, any beta of the operating system yet, so as soon as they will, we will f try to figure it out. Any other questions? So when you said uh, you've been in contact with Steam, what was their response? Uh, Dennis? Uh, we still working with Steam because they, they Currently, quite busy uh, oh, de 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 dealing with new operation operation system, but uh, we hope that they will fix at least do like protection process on Windows, so no other application can read memory of currently running process. Thank you. Thank you very much once again, Paul Ambrosio, junior analyst at Kaspersky Club. Paul, anyway, we need to drink. Pecha Kucha Tequila style. Um, maybe Dennis can help you. Dennis, join us. I will bring you one more. You no, 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 no. Cheers. Thank you. Um,
And the next one, and again, in the same format, will be Mr. Fyodor Yurochkin, threat analyst from Varmore, right? But I think he will explain him in a better way, right? Yeah. So just let us prepare the slides. I, I never did the uh, no, 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 Pichakul no. thing before, so no clicker. If, no, I, if I'm not good will, on... Uh, we will click him. Huh? Well, click. You, you can click, yeah, as, as you wish. We have 20 seconds. <laughs> I kind of like tried to, to uh, stick my slides into the format, so I removed like the question slides, but at any point of time, either like uh, drop us an email or like I think we will have a question thing. So starting. I will tell you to start. One second. Let's go. Go. All right. Um, so this is basically um, not really a research effort, like not only by us. There were like quite a few other people who like contributed insights and like notes and stuff like this. But um, basically, like me and Vladimir, I think we have like very um, unique way of like looking at the things. I'm based in Taiwan, but I'm originally from Kyrgyzstan. And this is why like, I think I got myself in involved in uh, incident response was like one of uh, uh, related uh, attack campaigns that happened in Central Asia. And uh, th there was like quite a few like interesting experiences from the point of like finding like affected sites to uh, working with the uh, governments in Central Asian region and they tend to ignore you. But basically, uh, a number of government sites have been continuously um, compromised by like, uh, defaced uh, campaigns. So, like, the defacement or compromise of those, like, in, even like government websites, is not a news. But what was particularly interesting that uh, one of those compromises was actually related to a geopolitical situation or a geopolitical incident was in the region, and. Uh, one of the like panda affiliated groups was uh, triggering signatures uh, of quite a few security researchers and attracted quite a bit of uh, attention. So uh, there were like a series of like relevant incidents and we got a bunch of domain names which we believe are related to the same campaign. Uh, some of the domain names you won't find uh, much of the information on like virus total because they were like very, uh, uh, they were used in very specific occasions, but for some of the domains, like uh, I think hopto.org, I think Geos, you, you can find like hashes uploaded on uh, Threat Expert. Uh, so some of the indicators, uh, so far I think the best like indicator to link the, the campaigns under the same head is like the TTPs uh, type of the like backend platform the guys were using, uh, uh, like Habit. Uh, to you, to use the same uh, email account to initially pre-register or acquire the domain names and then move them to like uh, secret or like a new email, uh, email before the campaign would uh, start rolling. So this is one of like the uh, samples that you would actually be able to find on Threat Expert. Uh, there are a couple of like other domain names which match uh, similar pattern. And this is like, I think where like uh, things like passive DNS are, come handy, you can roughly reconstruct how like the timing of the campaign by even looking like when those domain names were active, when the, those domain names were not active. And if you start looking at, into the like geopolitical situation, there was like a tense negotiation between Kyrgyzstan and China on railroad thing. And roughly the negotiation finished in February and uh, Kyrgyzstan decided to go with like Russia on like uh, doing the contracts, but if you start like looking at the uh, timestamps when the scripts were uploaded, you will notice that like the dates basically were like when the actual compromises were taking place were very close to uh, the timing when negotiations were, were taking place. So if you reconstruct the actual incident, you will notice that they start like preparatory actions in like September uh, 13, and then start like moving on uh, and the actual attack. Uh, when like uh, snow signatures uh, start like being detected, happened like uh, s uh, 7th of October, attackers did their own OPSEC thing quite well as well. So from the point when like uh, the incident was discovered by security community to the point then when they like uh, took the whole infrastructure down, it only took like three, five days. 
and they were still like serving some content like in midnight uh, on the day just before they like decide to cease the operations. So if you look at the history, you, you will notice that they are like habit like or like this particular group they they acquire uh, domain names as they expire. So like most of the domain names they use, they have like good reputation. So like whitelisting uh, wouldn't like really work. And then on the incident handling side, like when we noticed that uh, like uh, two of the like core government websites were serving uh, links to like APT group, we, we actually called to the admins and they're just, well admins are on a summer vacation so they can't really take care of the thing. But then um, what we may, were able to do with dumped list of, because uh, uh, basically this was like a watering hole type of attack. And, but it was staged so they were serving the JavaScript which would run fingerprinting on um, target machines and this is like one of the screens of their backend platform and store like uh, all the data of the IP addresses in the database and you will notice that they were mainly like interested just in f for um, IP addresses so it was like a Ministry of Foreign Affairs, a military and admin office for uh, Kyrgyz government and like, what they basically get to collect they will collect the like browser information, typical, but they also like through the JavaScript fingerprinting, they were able to verify whether certain, certain files existed on the machine. And if they did, they would know like, yeah, you're running like Kaspersky 212 version or you were running uh, shockwaves and so on. And the fingerprinting system itself just had like a bunch of signatures. So list of the files that they fingerprint for and the actual software like that is, they believe would be installed on the machine if, uh, that folder existed on the machine. The actual way of like doing this kind of fingerprinting has been uh, presented on like conferences in China, I think 2012, 2013. So, and this is not a vulnerability per se, it's more like a feature. You can basically run a JavaScript, render an image, handle the exception. If, the, if, if exception happens, then file does not exist. And you will notice like if you start poking around their backend platform, you will notice that it also has a feature once they're happy with the like fingerprints of the targeted systems, they can actually put a JavaScript and serve it to the targets to deliver the actual payload. And just a last note, uh, uh, the way they like host the operation was like all done on um, VPS, like several machines that uh, we looked to. It just, the IP addresses where the hosting was taking place was not absolutely related to the guys. It was just like short term, like uh, one week, two weeks rental of VPS systems. And I think I'm uh, round of Done. out of time. Up yeah, so do we have any questions? What do you think about this patch of culture? <laughs> I'm almost out of my breath. <laughs> any questions? It was funny, uh, more or less. He sometimes he talks nothing about something different than on the slide, I think. Well, yeah, because like <laughs> I'm, I'm still like on, on the previous slide and the, and the whole well, thing. Well, it was so, funny. But, yeah, yeah, I liked it. Any questions to Fyodor? Or comments, or you can start throwing your shoes here. Thank you very much. Tequila shot, uh, please, can somebody drink instead of me? <laughs> ah, Chris, thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Marco? Come, come. So let me introduce you the next speaker, head of research center in Europe, Mr. Marco Preuss, are you ready? What do you feel? Yeah. Good. After, after, after one shot and the other track already? Ah, you did open mic? Yeah, of course. What was the topic of your open mic? Uh, password cracking. Oh my. You know, God. that's one, one topic I like to talk about. Okay, so one, two, three, start. Hey, um, I'll talk a bit about um, dark nets, um, meaning what we call dark nets. In principle, uh, dark nets uh, are just overlay networks over the clear net. Um, where people can access specific resources uh, just available um, by using, for example, specific tools. Um, I just focused on the three main ones, which is I2P, Tor, and Freenet. 
um, because the other ones are not real for like browsing and getting content, it's more about sharing. You'd see this here also, um, that like GNUnet or RetroShare, which are also kind of famous, are more peer-to-peer -peer services in order to share files between friends, like stuff you don't want to put on a public web, web server or whatever. Um, I2P, um, which is a successor partly of Freenet because some of the developers from Freenet just went to I2P. Uh, it's focusing only on internal services. You have a proxy to access ClearNet, so regular websites, but very slow. And the good thing here, they also like torrenting on it, so there are a lot of file sharers. Uh, there are more than 3,700 EEP sites at the moment. This is the name for internal darknet only I2P websites. While I checked it, there are roughly 8% of them just available. Um, most of them, that was quite interesting. I did some uh, categorization of that. There's a large portion of Russian speaking uh, sites with an I2P. It's just a bit of like black market and financial services, but that's not the main point. Most of the stuff is more about file sharing. Uh, Tor, which is yeah, kind of the most known one, is good for clear net access because there are a lot of um, kind of out proxies or exit nodes where you can browse um, the net, but you also have like the internal services which are hosted at .onion. Um, I did a check from the ones I had. Um, most of them are offline because they yeah, are not always available, 19% online. And recently, as you know, some law enforcement agencies just took down some of the websites, which are currently, from what I see, uh, about 2% from all of them, I know. And interesting here, I also thought did this categorization uh, what is normally said, like these pedophile and illegal porn stuff, it's not so widely distributed within Tor anymore. Most of it is more about financial services, so everything which is about money, drugs, whatever. Here's just a short plot of different sources with different onion addresses. So you see you need to go out and find yourself the addresses for onions, uh, through some ways uh, to be able to use that. Freenet um, is a bit strange, to be honest, uh, because you have like only the internal free sites, no clear net access, no up proxies or whatever, uh, and it's a distributed storage system. Uh, there is a lot of crazy content in there. Um, also very old content, so I haven't found a lot of sites which are actual. Uh, most of that stuff is like from 2008, 2009, um, and there is a lot of stuff you don't want to visit normally. I did uh, a few screenshots. What you can find, like in I2P, there is a nice chess game, which was quite funny. The SIN is Quite interesting, they host a lot of information about specific countries, you can just search, it's like kind of a wiki. Uh, and Tor, as you can see, a lot of financial services and also, that's why I meant it before, uh, like uh, supporting terrorists, buying guns and drugs and mushrooms and the Citibank thing here is a forum for Carters um, and Freenet is more uh, some some normal like they call it flocks we would say blocks um, and of course also some file sharing stuff but less than an I2P and in Tor file sharing is not that uh, widely used. Some fun sites also there is a full in browser Super Mario Bros game in I2P which was quite funny I played it a bit uh, so it's working really nice. Um, so if you have time, that's some good content uh, besides the other stuff. Uh, on Tor, some nice website which was just recently activated, the Cat Facts. 
There are more than 3,000 facts about cats, and you click, and you get some funny note about cats. Yeah, so what? That's nice. Um, and yeah, recently, I don't know if you have noticed that Facebook also went to Tor. Uh, they're hosting now Facebook within uh, on an Onion website, so you can somehow anonymously browse Facebook. Uh, okay, let's see how this develops. Any questions on that? What do you think? How do you evaluate this Petra Kucha? Like, guys, you're quite good, I think. Like, you always do Petra Kucha style presentations. What? You always do Petra Kucha style presentation, right? No, normally not. But it, Any it's, que it's okay. Any <laughs> questions to Marco? Anybody? People are too shy. Plus. Thank you. Yeah. But I like to. Again, 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 <laughs> again, again. Cheers. We have Galadin in front of us. Chris. Huh? No, no, no. Last gentleman presenting today. <laughs> Let me introduce you a good friend of us, a um, guy who helped us in the program committee paper selection. But anyway, uh, Chris, what is it, what, which SAS is for you? Like, how many times have you been with us at SAS? Uh, fourth year. Fourth year. Thank yeah. you very much for your. First year was Cancun. Uh, come full circle. Ah, fine. So, Mr. Chris Sang, Vice President of Research at Veracode, please welcome his Petra Kucha. Chris, do you have like 2020 slides? First time. No cheating? No cheating. Well, I have some notes here. Okay. So, <laughs> please go. <laughs> okay. All right. First, the uh, description in the program is wrong. Uh, I forgot to tell Ryan the new title, so... It's actually about application parameter, not about whatever it said in the program. I'm going to start by saying that I'm a software person. I've been doing application security for 15 years. And so everything I say is kind of biased by a software perspective. And you just need to get over that. So once upon a time, way back in the good old days, in the 1990s, there was this notion of a parameter. <laughs> and that was the combination of network devices, mostly firewalls, that prevented or policed the, the activity that would be allowed into your network. And that was all well and good up until the point where companies decided that they wanted to do more than brochureware. So I worked for a company that published this ad back in the beginning of 2001. And what we were saying was if you wanted to conduct business over the internet, you actually needed to allow more people into your network. You're opening up ports all over the place. And we were trying to raise awareness of the need for application security, uh, which was under the radar at that point, and we were selling it, so it was kind of important to do. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, Alex Damos, who's the CISO of Yahoo right now, opened up his keynote at AppSec California, uh, saying that AppSec is eating security. And what he meant by that is that AppSec is going to be the most important, impactful, critical niche of security for the foreseeable future. So uh, we're going to drill down into two topics here. When you're learning to drive, what's the first thing that you learn about your side mirrors? It's that you have a blind spot. And the same thing applies in software. There's certain things that you just can't see over your shoulder. And most companies have a blind spot when it comes to their application inventory. Uh, the reason this matters is pretty simple. You can't protect what you don't know about. Every application is shiny and new at some point in its history, but many of them fall into disrepair. Developers move on to new projects. Uh, micro, uh, micro sites set up by marketing uh, get forgotten about. People spin up sites in AWS. They assign C names to them, and they just get forgotten about. In addition to that, you've got M&A uh, acquisitions where you acquire a company, you inherit applications as well. So that blind spot gets pretty big. On average, when we help companies uh, understand their application perimeter, we find about 40% more than they actually knew about in their application inventory. So how do you use that information to get better? One thing that you can do when you find a bunch of vulnerable applications that you don't know about is to just shut them down. 
start figuring out which things you can get rid of and decommission them. Uh, the notion of attack surface reduction is the idea that you can improve your security posture by just removing things uh, from being attacked at all in the first place. So let's illustrate this notion of application sprawl. Say you're a large global application or organization with thousands of apps and Shellshock comes along. What do you do? In case you need a reminding, Shellshock was a remote command execution in all versions of Bash dating back to 1994. Okay, so, oh, come on, all right. So within a couple of days of Shellshock, uh, we had scanned about 10,000 sites across our customer base. We found that about one in 450 was vulnerable. And probably more than that was vulnerable. We were using a very simplistic scan. But, so that's kind of like the low bar for it. This is not an efficient way to measure exposure, but if you don't have a good inventory of what you have, how else do you approach this problem? Okay, let's switch gears to topic number two. Underneath the Andaz Hotel in London is this re uh, renovated Masonic temple. It was built in 1912. It was lost for a while. They discovered it when they were renovating about a decade ago behind a fake wall. And actually, it's now rented out for corporate events, as you do. Uh, this is irrelevant, except for the fact I needed to fill 20 seconds. So about a year and a half ago, I was doing a dinner in that room, and a customer from a very large bank made a comment that he was aware of 150 different versions of Java that he was dependent on in his application environment. He also said that he had spent two months so far trying to hunt down all of the apps in his inventory that were vulnerable to a recent Struts RCE. He would spent two months on this. So why was this so difficult of a problem for him? It's because applications look kind of like this. They're like a mixture, a mush of custom code and shared libraries. And the more time passes, the more we lose track of what the ingredient list was that made up those applications. This is what you actually need to know when it comes time to patch a vulnerability. What were the ingredients? Which versions of which libraries did you use in every single application you own, whether you built it or you bought it? If you can't answer that question, you're going to have a very bad time any time a vulnerability comes out. So now imagine you're a large enterprise and Heartbleed comes out. What do you do? I'll remind you again that Heartbleed was a severe information leakage vulnerability that affected certain versions of OpenSSL. And as long as you can identify all of your apps, you know where all of them are and which versions of OpenSSL they use, you're going to have no problem fixing this issue. It's too bad nobody could do that. The first few days after Heartbleed, again, we went back and looked at about 25,000 customer apps, and we found that about 7.5% of all the C and C++ apps that we looked at were definitely vulnerable to Heartbleed, and quite a few others were potentially vulnerable, but we didn't know what the patch level of the OS was. They didn't know this because they didn't have a good application inventory. A couple other data points. This is a histogram showing dependencies on vulnerable versions of the Struts library about a year after a significant RCE vulnerability was announced in 2013. So look at all the different versions that people have running a year after the vulnerability was announced. This is just a three-month slice of data, and like the versions are all over the place. This is the same thing for a vulnerability that came out in 2012, in the MySQL Java connector. Again, this is just apps from the past three months and they're still using all these different vulnerable versions of the MySQL Java connector. I think part of the reason people aren't upgrading is because they haven't internalized what a huge problem this is. So we're nearly at the end here. I hope these two points are pretty clear to you. Number one, we routinely lose track of what we have, and we can't secure what we don't know about. Number two, for the stuff that we do know about, if we don't know what's made out of libraries and versions, uh, we can't possibly secure it. So I think these are the two biggest software security problems that we have going forward. Uh, that's it. I think we have more time for questions, but I thought we would only have 15 seconds, so. <laughs> Thank you very much. There you go. Amazing, fantastic. And I really enjoyed your slides. A lot of content. Any questions to Chris? Uh, wake up. I know that this is the last session, but anyway, Katie. Chris, is it okay if I take a shot with you right now? All right. <laughs> any, other, any other serious questions? That was serious. Oh, I know. Uh, tequila shot, then. Uh, again, me? Katie? Uh, uh. No, 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 no. Come on. Okay. I have gala dinner. Come on. Come on. Let's, Come on. let's. Suck it up. Wait for me, wait for me, wait for me. Oh. We still have... Sometime. We have 15 seconds. <laughs>
Oops. Peer pressure wins again. Oops. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Okay. Lechaim. Thank you. And uh, last presentation for the Security Analyst Summit. And this is my great honor to introduce you the next speaker. And I, again, this is my favorite, to be honest. I, I didn't know your content, but still, I know this, this next presentation content. But anyway, I really hope that you will enjoy it. Uh, let me introduce you a beautiful lady uh, who is IT, IT service manager in Kaspersky Lab. So please welcome Anna Morina. So this is last last presentation for this summit. I hope you will enjoy it. Please go. Okay, my name is Anna Morina, and uh, for the last two days we have been listening to few, a lot of security researchers telling you a lot of things about security. Uh, I am myself started as system administrator. Um, now I'm IT service manager, as Sergey mentioned before. For three years already, I'm working in Kaspersky Lab. Su support, um, I'm responsible for support and development of customer support systems. And I think it's, more, it's less than 20 seconds. <laughs> but OK, we all know that for business to survive, we need to have customers. But for business to prosper, we need to have happy customers. And this is very important that you keep your customers happy. They will return to you. They will bring you the money. and you you will be okay. But at the moment when security is everywhere, it's not so easy to keep, to keep the business safe and to keep the customers happy. I will give you a few examples of how very simple, very common security devices implemented lead to customers being not happy. One of them is, um, so if a bad person has a database of emails and he would like to know uh, emails and passwords, and he would like to know if they will be okay for your service, the very cheap way is to put CAPTCHA. It will prevent the bots from logging in. It will also prevent people from logging in. If you put the CAPTCHA, the unconditional one, the amount of people who successfully log in into the page, into your service, has dropped from um, for like 30% or even more. We all know that if, if we log out the user quick, then the bad person will not be able to steal his session credentials and will not be, be able to use the data uh, to access the data that is available f for this person. But as well, all the people, for the quick, uh, if we implement quick logout, all the people are getting frustrated or angry, um, they will start complaining a lot. Customers were saying very, very angry things, a lot of threats and stuff like that. So a very simple way to prevent bad people from getting the user database, if they have emails already, is to give uncertain messages. If they, in, if they try to restore the password and they try the email, but the system is not responding in a different way, then the use, they will not have the database. But the user, as well, will not understand if he is supposed to get the email or not. He will be sitting till he gets dead, <laughs> waiting for the email to come, and then later he's going to complain, as usually. Uh, virtual keyboard is good, and it is protecting from keyloggers. If you use virtual keyboard, then it's not that easy to get the data that you're inputting, your login, your password, anything else. But as well, when it was implemented by few banks and uh, you had to use virtual keyboard to enter your login and to enter your password, the time to log in has increased from three to five times. And of course, people started to complain. People were very unsatisfied. They didn't like it. Password complexity is 
um, password complexity policy is common for both inside services and outside services. You have to have like 10 symbols, capital letters, small letters, digits, and uh, special characters. Okay, for a forum account, for real, what are you going to protect me from? From somebody stealing my pancakes for Sipe or whatever? Do not overuse this one. <laughs> And, uh, but the password policy is not ending on just being a very complex one. A another thing is um, it should expire every 90 days. It's very common in a lot of organizations. And, uh, well, the very easy one, your password should not comply with five previously used passwords. I myself spent 25 minutes trying to create a password which I have not used before, but I think it was more than five passwords. But what do people do? They start uh, writing down, putting stickers on their monitor with their passwords. That's very secure. And of course, they will start complaining and coming to IT saying, I forgot my password. A lot of old school security uh, Company, uh, companies which have old school security guys say that no social networks should be allowed, no file sharing services should be allowed. Because from, from their perspective, it's the number one resource of getting infected, getting malware. But at the, um, at the current stage, there are jobs that depend on the services. Social media is very important for social media division. They have to react really quickly to any complaints from the customers, and they have to take care of this. Um, so developers, if they have access to stage, it's OK. Everybody says that. But you're not allowed to have any permissions on the live systems. You can develop whatever you want to on the stage system, but no, you cannot develop anything on the live system. Yeah, if this is out-of-the-box solution, probably. But for custom-made systems, it can lead to a very huge amount of time that this person is going to spend on getting the access to the system. And, of course, it's going to lead to money losses and reputational losses. So I'm not saying to you that you should not use any of the security advices that you've heard, but you should have brain and use them carefully. You should have heart to love your customers and take care of them. You should have courage to face the difficulties, or you can go home. Fantastic. Anna Mora in the Kaspersky Lab, thank you so much. Any questions to Anna, last presenter? I, I'm sure that you should have any questions. I wouldn't say so much as a question, but I think that it's really important to bring usability back to the conversation around security features. And so I would love to see more than a six minute talk on this somewhere. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, may I ask you a question? Because it's, for me, it's quite obvious as a, being an employee of Kaspersky Lab. Okay. What about policies in Kaspersky Lab? <laughs> Uh, we do think a lot before implementing policies Spasiva. in Kaspersky Lab. And uh, we do moni keep monitoring the situation with the service, how customers are responding to this policy, if it's internal customers or external customers, it doesn't really matter. And if we see any trends, which uh, I would say no good, then we will have to roll things back quickly or fix implement the fix which will lead to the back into an in increase of the service usage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna Morina. Thank you, everybody, for being with us.